Welcome to the Weekly Bioanalysis, a KCAS podcast. Hello, and welcome to the 51st episode of the Weekly Bioanalysis, the official podcast of KCAS Bioanalytical and Biomarker Services. KCS is a bioanalytical CRO serving the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical industries for over 40 years. My name is Dominic Warino, and I've been in the bioanalytical ligand binding assay and cell-based assay space for a little over 27 years. I'm here with my co-host, John Perkins. Hello, I'm John Perkins. Um, I've also been in the bioanalytical space for around 26 years, um, and my focus is on LCMS technologies. John and I are senior scientific advisors at KCAS, and either or both of us are available to answer any questions you may have regarding this podcast or any of KCS services. Well, we're thrilled to have you listening to our 51st episode. It's, av- it's available virtually everywhere. Wherever you choose to play and find your podcast, you can now likely find the weekly bioanalysis. So John, um, you know, we're, we started this due to COVID, but we're long past that now. If you're not familiar with our podcast, I'm in Kansas City. John is located in upstate New York, and our producer is in the middle of Missouri. Um, you know, with that, John, we're, if you're not familiar with the uh, structure of the podcast, we're going to go over um, some news and resources. Then we'll go over a topic of our choosing, choosing which today is a, is a great topic. John will go over that agenda in a minute. We'll talk some, about some feedback from our audience, and then we'll leave you with a teaser for next week. So John, why don't you tell us a little bit about the agenda for this week? So we're going to follow the usual pattern where we'll talk through COVID news, non-COVID news. Um, and then the main topic today is, is small molecules, the new agents coming available for COVID patients. Yeah, fascinating stuff, John. And with that, why don't we just kick it right into the news and resources? Why don't you get us started? Sure. First topic up is um, by unanimous vote, CDC Advisory Committee endorses Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine for kids 5 to 11. I mean, this is relatively old news now, but I still thought it was worth talking about because this is, you know, we we have emergency recommendation and actually authorization of the Pfizer vaccine for 5 to 11 year olds and uh, rollout has started across the country. And I think there's, I, I think I read somewhere last week or earlier this week that um you know they've they've as up to like a million kids have been been vaccinated or started their dose of vaccination so yeah great news to to see that you know the the vaccine has been made available for more and more age groups yeah john you know my um i know several children that have now been vaccinated my sister was very excited when this had done in fact she sent me a picture just two days ago when he got vaccinated my nephew he's 10 she's breathing a little sigh of relief um and then per, some friends who, whose children, they've been waiting a long time for this. I, I think it's a um, long time coming. Great stats on it. I don't know if we want to cover that a little bit, but I thought I'd jump right in with some personal notes. And I think sure. a lot of people are, you know, a lot of people were really waiting for this because they had really been uh, sort of, not sort of, they have been still in COVID protocols because their children weren't vaccinated. So, and then, uh, you, you know, just in terms of some numbers, like you said, there's, I think the number is over a million now, but that's steadily on the rise, I think it's just a matter of signing up. And then, um, you know, the study itself, uh, they, they did some pretty pretty extensive study, 2,300 children or something like that. It seemed to be a pretty good number of um, children. But again, we just continue down the path of normalcy and uh, hopefully we're back to, back to you know, kind of kind of opening our lives up fully. But this is a great, it's a great thing. And it's definitely something that, you know, happened a few weeks ago, but we, we want to make sure we cover it here. And if you have any concerns about it, please do, you know, forward any questions you might have. But certainly I have some strong opinions on it, John, and I think it's completely safe. Oh, sure. So just, just as a little bit of detail, I mean, this is for five to 11 year olds and the dose is a third of the size provided to people 12 and older. Um, so they have a, a similar two shot series. I wonder if that will become a third as they get more data. Um, but the two shots are 21 days apart, similar to how we started out. Um, and then, the, you know, the, so like, how will they know? It's, so the the vials for um, for children in that this age group have an orange cap as opposed to purple and grey capped vials for those aged 12 and older. So on on the topic of the vaccine, I actually went and had my booster shot. Um, was it, I think, about a week, over a week ago, a couple of weeks ago. And um, it, it was interesting that as the third 
time having it, it was actually that I it was my I reacted most this time. So on the I had it on the Friday afternoon, that was fine. Saturday was not great, and then by about halfway Sunday, I sort of kicked back to being normal again. But yeah, I had I had a fairly rough sort of thirty six hours. But I mean, with planning um, international travel, it made sense to go ahead and do it. And and I, I think New York is really pushing now for anyone who's eligible to go go and get the booster shot if they can. Yeah, Massachusetts, same way. My mom got it. Uh, my brother's in line to get his third shot. But no, the, I think a booster shot's a great thing. And uh, my, my mother just experienced some arm pain. Um, it's interesting that you, you know, this is your first reaction of, of anything of any type after the three. Is that right? First, yeah, first major, first really noticeable. I think the first first shot, I didn't notice anything. Second, a bit. But, I mean, on the Saturday, I was... I, w- I felt rough. Yeah. It was very much those sort of fevery type of um, symptoms, you know, where it was like cold and then hot and you ached and everything yeah. else. But yeah. honestly, it, it, it was it was 36 hours and and, and it, it really was, I just, it was like almost an over, like one minute to the next snapped yeah. out of it. And it no, was, but that, yeah. that's good. You know, that's a sign. You know, they say that they, they the science indicates that's a sign you're immunized for sure. Um, that type of um, re- response in such a kind of think of the pharmacokinetic of the response. It's pretty quick. That means you've had some central memory that was connected and augmented, you know, and then you're you're back to normal, which is a heck of a lot better than, you know, seven or eight days of it and, and potential hospitalization. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, Those that are listening, uh, please yeah. do get vaccinated, especially my brother. Um, I've been pushing him hard. He's he's finally eligible again due to some health issues, but he's yeah. still on the fence. But no, me, I, I'm, it, not, I'm not complaining about the fact I felt no great for a day. No, that, and, that's and, you know, maybe we can touch on it now. There's been some controversy around myocarditis and all these sorts of things. But I, I mean, I think I think there's really no evidence that getting a vaccine is is bad for you. I think a lot of this, we forget that these things happen to, uh, to athletes, particularly that's what I read about um, at, at a fairly high rate to begin with. So it's not unusual. And they they're trying to say it's vaccine related. But John, from what I can tell, I haven't seen anything. Uh, yeah, I, th- I think I think the fact that the number of cases have remained really small that it it really is a, a very minor minor thing to 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 be concerned well, about. I mean, we I talked mean, about this. Talk to your physician, and hopefully your physician wants you to get the vaccine. There's still some out there that are anti-vax almost, but you know, if you do have if you have a pre-existing myocard- myocarditis or something, then yeah, you you really should be careful. Sure, but that that's any yeah. vaccine. Forget yeah. COVID or anything else, but. You know, it's just it's so strange that the numbers are still, you know, we going back to our 50th podcast, the numbers are stagnant, John, and it's just mind blowing. I, I, it's it's somewhat. Well, anyhow, maybe we'll move yeah. on to this topic, I guess, but I still don't understand it. I just don't it, get it. it. It was interesting. And yeah, I do want to just quickly close out this um this uh this one news item just so we are talking about Pfizer but actually Moderna have also been running um trial testing for kids between 6 and 11 and they they have data that they're happy with and they're they'll be submitting that to the regulator soon so if if you know you've gone with Moderna rather than Pfizer there is you know information coming that says you know also you know that this is going to be available for kids as well so it means there will be more more resources but to go back to what i was saying it was really interesting i actually had my third shot exactly the same site as i had it um you know six months ago and you know where where i went when i went in march it was like this really slick operation it was a huge hall there was like constant flow of people and now it's a tiny hall on a different part of the state fairground in syracuse and it was it was much more low-key um but i mean it it was busy while i was there but obviously there just isn't that same demand and i like like you i would definitely encourage people that if they haven't had shots to get them if they've had two shots, I'd encourage them to get the the booster if they're eligible, and um, you know, obviously do whatever we can to protect ourselves, families, and friends, and 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 you know, yeah. let's put this put this thing beside behind us because I mean, there are there are other there are other um, you know other things coming that will help address COVID, and that really is our main topic. But you know, I still vaccine is the best way. 
I, it's the best way to prevent yourself getting really sick. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, yeah, don't rely. You're right, John. We're going to talk about that. But there are plenty of, you know, let's call them drugs or agents that are available to treat COVID patients. And they're going to continue to get better. But the key is vaccination. And, right, absolutely. And herd immunity. Yep. And, yep. and I'm still not eligible. I, I haven't. It hasn't been six months. So that's why. I haven't gotten mine. I think I got mine. It's coming up, maybe. Yeah, sure. Maybe another five. I, I think I got my second shot in May or something, so I'm getting close. But we'll sign up. And then, you know, on a side note, we've had long lines for flu vaccines. Really? Like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's That's the strangest thing. She yes. had a real, and uh, well, she had a she had a little bit of an insurance glitch, and like Walgreens or wherever. I think she, maybe it was Walgreens or CVS didn't her insurance didn't cover it or something, and then. Um, she had to go somewhere and there was quite a bit of line. And then even our business development uh, director out in the Bay Area, Chris Frankovic, she said she had quite, took her a couple hours to get a flu flu shot yesterday as well. So that just interesting, or maybe she was getting her third vaccine, but there seems to be, as you said, you know, you mentioned it, there was a lot of resources and a lot of people. And now you said, it, you know, a slick operation to more of a smaller one and I don't know if you had any delays, but uh, it's maybe it's just a small sample number. But I, I think there's just a uh, maybe like a an ebb and flow of uh, healthcare workers, and now it's a little problematic to get. Yeah, to get it, it, was, it was just a queue for a while, but it was nothing, nothing major. Well, so, well I mean, so, I don't know. Yeah, so we can move on. So let's move on to the next item, and and you know we talked about. Um, Obviously, we talked about the, the the global inequities in terms of vaccine distribution, and and Pfizer is has become increasingly the high profile um, vaccine just because it is getting through to authorization and approval quicker than the other vaccines that are out there. But these are a couple of items about Moderna and what their their plan is for the long term. Um, so it's basically as Moderna's search for African manufacturing site ramps up. Bansell answers criticism about donations. Um, there's a couple of things in there, but we'll really touch on the the Africa vaccine piece. And actually, Moderna has committed to supply up to 110 million doses of its COVID-19 vaccine to Africa, the African Union. In the meantime, they're actually look, assessing a number of countries for a manufacturing site. And it, it, it's it's it, it's always interesting as someone in you know in North America looking at. You, you think, oh, we want to establish something. It's easy, but of course, infrastructure is completely different in, in African countries. So th there's a lot of challenges to 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 actually setting up something like this. So they're, they've, they've basically narrowed it down to three to five countries, including Rwanda, Senegal, and South Africa. Um, but it, it, I mean, it, it's it, a lot of it is down to what they need to actually a identify a site and then build from there and they need to have a you know a good workforce with a solid educational sciences program as background because they want the the workforce yeah. to be local the longevity of the site the company wants to have location for the next 30 to 50 years and then it's things like quality of utilities which again this is what we take for granted but yeah. you know with, with africa with the, having much less resources that that's a consideration to think about yeah. as well as easy access to transportation and, and <laughs> you know, yeah. having experienced, you know, roads in like I'll say Madagascar again, but the roads there were, were, I mean, in some places were fantastic, but other places it really was. We're going down the roads, and you watched that everyone was was steering around the potholes, some of which were huge. And it, I mean, you 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 don't think about it until you experience it, and it, yeah. it's just. But this is this is all this all plays into it. I think it's I think it's good that they are. Um, they're looking to do this and also it, their long-term goal isn't it's not they're looking beyond COVID this is why they want the 30 to 50 year site is it's yeah. it's vaccines for unmet medical needs in Africa which is huge and I think we I, we may have another topic on it later and I th yeah I, I I should have found another news item, which we're not talking about this week, but about possible treatments for Bilharzia. And and so I think it's great that we're starting to read more about treatments for these long-term um, issues in Africa. And hopefully, yeah, if you've got a company like Moderna focusing that way, then then we can eradicate some of these um, 
the, these diseases. And I think yeah. uh, part of the issue with Moderna is uh, the point was made in one of the articles. Moderna are tiny. They're still, I mean, yeah. they, they haven't donated the same amount of doses as like Pfizer and J and J. But you know, Pfizer and J and J are complete behemoths compared yeah. to Moderna, yeah. who have, who have like a, a workforce in the. I think I think a th- about a thousand people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, no, it's, I know some people that work there. When it was a few hundred, yeah, they're yeah, they're so, not anywhere near the tens of thousands of people like Pfizer so, and so. Yeah. So they're trying to do a really ambitious thing, but they're also trying to grow the business to be ambitious. You know, so it's Moderna are very a very interesting um, yeah. case study. Anyway, I will pass it. Yeah, a few it things. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so if you remember, we had trouble in a DC plant making COVID vaccines, right? So never, sure. never mind. Yep, yeah. Yep. And so we have a dearth of, um, ish, you know, talent. You, you mentioned that, so it's not surprising that. Um, there's struggles. There, there's struggles. You know, we, I, I worked with some labs trying to put like flow cytometers, never mind vaccine manufacturing facilities. They couldn't get fresh water. So, mm-hmm. I mean, this is th- this is a huge step forward to help um, Africa. And then I'm going to throw some stats. Right. There's th- only about what, what was it? Four percent of the world's doses have been administered in, a- in Africa. Yes. I mean, Yep. Yeah, that, that's a problem, right? So, and we, we can't really get herd immunity until we start immunizing the world. And we talked about that early on. Um, I do think Moderna is, uh, despite, you know, the, the, what they're doing is actually quite altruistic for their size. I'm glad you sure, mentioned absolutely, that. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I agree. Not, it's not like they're trying to withhold things. They just don't have the resources. But, you know, this, this whole uh, thing is really going to help um, the future of Africa. And I think that is a good topic to talk about because, you know, we get a battery of vaccines here and now it's become the line light. And, you know, talking heads on news stations are talking about monoclonal antibodies. It makes me laugh. Right. But but we have had a um, from hepatitis vaccines to, you know, polio to um, measles and mumps and rubella. Those nations don't get those things, John. So sure. this, this yeah. um, vision that this Bansell, right, that's that's the company in Africa. What no, Bansell ban is that? the president of Moderna. Oh, I think he's sorry. the CEO, got, he's the CEO of Moderna. Moderna. So yeah. it's all Moderna making the, – they're going to build a plant there. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep, yep, yep. So that, that becomes a huge, like, you know, what, what a great thing for Moderna to be, um, you know, planting themselves there and hopefully helping for decades to come, right? That That's yep. what this is about. And I think it, it, it just just to touch touch on Stefan Bansell, basically his vision for Moderna's African plant pl- plant stems from the company's ten year plan. It didn't seem to didn't seem feasible, he said, to go at the level it would like to without having a presence on the continent. And that inspiration came during the time he lived in Asia as CEO of another company called BioMerio. So, I mean, he's he's ov- he's obviously thinking about this, and and like say that there's that long term long term. Th- thought of what they're going to do they, they they were they obviously um they had the technology to to really help address covid but they're i mean they have they're another of the co- their candidates is looking for and um, looking at producing a vaccine to treat the zika virus and um, they're also looking at what they can do to help yellow fever so these are these are things that we don't worry about but obviously are a huge issue in in, in you know yeah. in, in in developing countries so yeah. i yeah i i i, I it's it's a it I it's it's a very interesting topic and it's one I will you know I will yeah, one, keep visiting because one last it, thing about sorry one last <laughs> thing about Moderna they they're treating you know a lot of these mRNAs are going after cardiac disorders I don't know if you saw that that came out this week so they're using you know mRNA technologies to treat heart disease sure. that's how powerful these things are which is fantastic I um it, it's an incredible um. Not, not you know in a di- so not only are they having initiatives to build manufacturing sites in um, Africa, they're working on other vaccine, other um, infectious agents for vaccines, and then they're tackling you know cardiac, and they have plants for immuno oncology. So. You know, let's let, let, let's root let's root for Moderna and all these things. Yeah, right? sure. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so one last footnote to this. Uh, this is actually a, a different article, but I plucked this little piece. Um, but another another factor for Africa in terms of um, you know vaccination, it's it's also down to the supply chain, and we're we're increasingly seeing difficulty getting our hands on the supplies that we want in terms of you know tubes and columns and you know just just matrix that we deal with but actually um in africa there's a shortage of syringes um so the gates foundation is donating money to help uh, a kenyan manufacturer scale up 
so it can produce more syringes. And part also part of the issue is that these vaccines like the the Pfizer BioNTech um, actually requires a specialized syringe, so it isn't just pick a syringe off the shelf and use it. You know, there's there's yep. other factors come into play yep. here. No, so, it, yeah, I mean, good point. Yeah, it's, it's, it's there's lots of things at play here that to, to really that 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 we have to address and and obviously there's a lot of other minds are are focused on this because there's obviously that recognition that the the the, this this pandemic is a worldwide problem and we're all really in it together even though some of us are more advantageous position than others but really we have to help those who are, are 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 less well off because our, our our global health depends on helping the yeah. less well off. So anyway, yeah, that, John, that, John, it's be, the pan, you know just as another side note here, the the supply chains become such a major issue in our field that at the National Biotech Conference for AAPS, it's a it's a, um, a a discussion, and I'm on this panel with a lot of other industry leaders to discuss ways we're trying to adapt, and most notable is you know, using surrogate matrix for PK sure. analysis yep, because absolutely. we can't get it. So that's, you know, that, 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 that's maybe its own topic, but I wanted to give myself a shameless plug. I believe <laughs> that's uh, coming up in March or April. So stay tuned. Right? Feel, feel <laughs> free, Dr. Eagle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, this is one last note on COVID. This has been a lot of fun talking about COVID. It's been a while and there's a lot that's happening and uh, the, but this last one's a great. It's really cool. Tell us a little bit about some Chilean trees. So yeah, again, it's it, it. Once you dig into this, it's amazing all the different things that play into into treat to, uh, working against the pandemic. And this is a Chilean tree hold hope for new vaccines if supplies last. And as it turns as it turns out, there's a Quillet trees technically known as Quillagia saponaria, are rare evergreens native to Chile that have long been used by the indigenous Mapucho people to make soap and medicine. In recent years, they have also been used to make a highly successful vaccine against shingles and the world's first malaria vaccine, as well as foaming agents for products in the food, beverage and mining industries. And the COVID link is actually, it's it, it's been used for for two molecules which are made from the bark of branches pruned from older trees in Chile's forest are being used in Novavax's COVID-19 vaccine. Now, Novavax hasn't been authorized or approved, but it is still slowly inching through the, you know, obviously the development process and and they they push back their deadline a couple of times, but it's still moving forward. But um, the big concern here is because these Quillet trees that have, you know, molecules that are incredibly useful for or obviously vaccines and other things, they don't know how many trees there are and, and they've been relying on wild populations of the trees to date. Um, but it's, they're, they're at the point where you know they're starting to develop plantations to actually address this in the future because you know this could be it could be an issue in in the longer term if if you know we run out of trees then you 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 hold on some very important um, you know vaccines etc. Yeah, no, it makes it makes me think of the Medicine Man movie with Sean Connery. I don't remember that. Maybe I'm dating myself. I I've never seen it, but I know <laughs> that I had the thing where he, he supposedly took a mass spectrometer up a tree, and it's like, <laughs> how do you do that? Because certainly at the time the technology wasn't. I mean, now there's small portable mass specs, but there weren't at the time. I, John, I, it's I, like I, watching CSI. Don't don't pay too much attention to what they're doing. You know, oh, we're gonna get a fingerprint stat, right? No, but I got you. No, but it, yes, it, you know, we're going to solve this mystery by. Looking Looking down a microscope is going to tell us everything. Uh, but, oh, look at this PCR sequence. I've solved it all. It's like, yeah, it's just a gel. I got news for you. It's just an acrylamide. It's a dye, right? But um, so so it, it, I, I laugh, but, you know, nature holds the keys to, to Absolutely. everything. Absolutely. And this is just an example of it. And I, it's a fascinating thing. I mean, if you don't – the part of the reason why medicine is so extraordinary to me to study is you, you'll never study it all. You know, if you went back and looked at the history of, you know, just bare pharmaceuticals and how they they, you know, they used like oils and all sorts of stuff to make their small molecule compounds and then plant based science is unbelievable. The diversity of botany is it's just mind blowing how little we really know and uh, how much there's to learn. So th- this is just, it's a great story. It makes me want to go to Chile. That, that That's my ending. So I, I want to go to Chile, maybe. Take a look at some trees. I hear it's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, Ch- Chile is on my list. My 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 father was a marine biologist, and he was actually invited to do like um he, he went for, to do like 
taught some courses at I think Conception University. He and my mum absolutely loved the country, and it's, yeah. it's that's why it's high on my list of places to go to. But uh, so, that, like you say, this uh, the when we talk about Novavax, it's the the um, you know this has been. This is used in the the GSK shingles vaccine, Shingrix, and also in um, the GSK's malaria vaccine that we will touch on a little bit later. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's you know, there's actually companies looking at trying to um, maybe synthesize the the compounds, yeah. and, and they must be compounds. That's hard to do, it's right? Synthesis. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's like it nature, nature can make these things, but some of these natural products are actually really yeah. difficult to. Yeah, this just we don't to, have um, it, how you can, like postulate it. Yeah, I'm sorry to talk over you there, but it no, is. No, it's fine, it's fine. It, it, you think it's real simple to make a naturally? It takes it could take decades to mimic it the right mm-hmm. way, um, because there's so you know what what do you you're going to grow it up in E. coli. Um, an insect cell, a cho cell. I mean, you got a lot of choices to start out of the gate and all of that has an impact. And then obviously folding and potency, right? That's the big thing. Yeah. Um, but no, it, it, it is a, it's one of those uh, stories that, um, you know, when I see Shingrax and all this, like, man, th- th- this is clever that they're going to have a workaround True. because Shingrax yeah. is a very good vaccine. Um, almost everybody I know, Who's of a certain age takes that one? You should certainly be getting. I, I'm. I said I need to look into it, but like I said yeah. before, I had ch- I'm I had getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> yeah, I've had so, it once, and it's brutal. So, yeah. no, um, do we so, want to move yeah, on to non-COVID? Or I'm, what, I'm just going to quickly mention something very quickly. I mean, so the one company that is has got plantations going, they're called Desert King International Limited. Um, they have a, a a plantation in Casablanca, which I'm not sure where that is, um, but they're they're Novavax's sole supplier of quilly extracts, and the, uh, so it's obviously in Chile, and it, it's the largest. They're Chile's largest quilly exporter, and they say they currently they can produce enough extract from older trees to make 4.4 billion vaccine doses in 2022. So this isn't like a it's not a crisis yeah, not or anything, but it's just. It, it just it just shows. I mean, it, 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 you're right. It, it, this is an interesting story because it talks about how how we're be, how be, nature can help us, and um, you know, it, it's there's, there's a lot of things play into this. It's, yeah. it's, it's whether it's vac- you know whether it's uh, plant uh, extracts for making vaccines or chips in our vehicles. There's just all sorts of things that we need to proactively start thinking about in terms of resources and supply chains. And- sure. Absolutely. It's just a, yeah. it's yeah. fantastic. I, I, I'm th- these types of stories, John, are you kind of put me in a good mood. I was in kind of a rotten mood for Thursday morning, but uh, no, <laughs> it's it's been really cool to think about. And then I had I was in Chile for a little while. You know, I was visualizing. Yeah, myself, yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah, yes, and, yes. I'm, yeah, I'm so kind of envious. You're going to one of my favorite, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah, let's so we'll let's move on it. to some non-COVID let's, stuff. Let's move on to non-COVID, and um, I don't. Th- this is. I think oh, this is probably more what you you probably know more yeah. about this than I do. Wow. This um, is a so, big story, yeah. Yeah, it's it is it's the state. I th- I thought this was worth including just because it talks about it provides the background to where a lot of the where some of the information comes from that has really helped medicine develop. And it's this is a state of Henrietta Lacks, Sue's Thermo Fisher over the improper sale of her immortal her mortal cells. Um, and basically, I, do, do you know do you know the Henrietta Lacks story? Shall I pass? You, it no, you can tell you you can tell it. I, I I mean, I worked on HeLa cells as part of my doctorate, so maybe I owe her something. But you know, you you can you can go ahead and I don't know the whole story. I, I haven't seen the biography, but I know the cell line very well. I got my doctorate yes. on cervical cancer. So Hen, Henrietta Lacks, this is back in the. Um, fifty one. Yeah, yeah, so before yeah. her death in 1951, um, her tissue was biopsied by cell biologist George Gaywell. She was under anesthesia and undergoing treatment for cervical cancer at Johns Hopkins in 1951. After discovering that her cells could be repeatedly reproduced and survive longer than others he'd examined, Gay began sharing the immortal cells with other scientists and and even harvested more from her body after death later that year. Um, all this done without her family's knowledge or consent. And so the the, the importance of, of Henry Lacks cells is this cell line was used to validate the first polio vaccine. It was used to help develop the papillo papillomavirus vaccines. Um, her cells have been used in tens of thousands of studies spanning cancer, AIDS, in vitro fertilization, radiation, and more. And we're also key to the creation of gene mapping techniques that led to the Human Genome Project. So 
so Henrietta Lack's name is obviously going to be immortalized because she has done, unbeknownst to her, she's done a massive amount in terms of in helping ensure the health of millions of people. Um, but the part, the issue here is this: the, her cells were taken without her knowledge, her family's knowledge, and they haven't really been compensated for either. So the family are actually looking to try and get some sort of control over you know, be part of the process in terms of where are these cells being used and, you know, being acknowledged that, you know, this is where the cells come from and, and be, you know, be compensated for it, which, I mean, I, I don't see how you can argue with that, yeah. but I'm going to pass, pass it back to you. Well, I mean, as I read through some of this, John, I'm sitting there thinking, wow, I've got at least one publication where I used HeLa cells and maybe now I have to like, you know, see if the, they got to do something to make it because they want to be a contributing uh, author in publications, right? Family's contribution. Sure. Yeah. You know, it's, I'm a little torn by something like this, John, because I don't, I don't know the whole story. I'm sure back in 1951, you know, um, George Gay, Gay, Gay wasn't maliciously trying. To, no, absolutely. I'm, I'm not know, suggesting that for a minute. It's not no. like uh, the Jersey dentists or uh, people like that who were stealing body parts or taking, taking, you know, gold caps out of people and all these horror stories you hear about physicians or even physicians who are, you know, given PBS instead of the vaccine itself. This, this is somebody who um, was doing a, probably a standard kind of battery of tests at the time or, you know, biopsies at the time. And, you know, kind of, kind of got lucky, right? I think science and hard yeah, work and luck yeah, go hand in yeah. hand. And then it spawned into, like I said, I mean, I'm very familiar with the cell line. You wouldn't have the Gardasil vaccines. It seems like you wouldn't have the polio vaccine or when I say wouldn't have it might've taken longer. It's hard yes, to determine. Exactly. Right. But like this, yeah. this accelerated the process because it was such a great model. Like I said, I used it for um, extracting HPV seven proteins. It was such a good source to confirm and feed uh, cells to it to confirm like, Hey, these peptides are actually, you know, here's a whole protein. We took it out of it and said, Oh, our peptides match, you know, a, a, a true version of it. So it's been a great model, a great thing, but you know, they probably should get compensated, right? Like yeah, this, yeah, this yeah. is a thing where, yeah. you know, make them, make them right. And she should be acknowledged. And I, I think HBO, the HBO special, I saw a little bit of it. I think it's an HBO special. I saw parts of it. Very good. They didn't take a, um, you know, it's not a race thing. It's, it, it's not an, it's not a Tuskegee airman thing. You know, th this is just something that we can make right, you know, yeah, absolutely. years later. Yeah. And, that, and that's yeah. what this is about. But yep. if you don't know this story, go check it out. Um, it, it is a really fascinating thing about how we can't advance without some degree this happening. We just yeah, have to I, do it ethically, yeah. right? Or, or yeah, absolutely. Yep, yep. Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, a lot of it is, 1950 is a very different time from now. And you, you, you're right. I, I think it would be much more regulated now what you can do in terms is, of using patient samples, et cetera. But, some you know, people are trying to portray it as, you know, they stole it from her and all this stuff. That None of that happened. It, it was just a guy who had a biopsy, discovered something, and didn't think about it, right? But there mm -hmm. should be restitution now. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I'm, I'm, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm. I think the family should should benefit from from yeah. you know what their ancestor provided because, like, say the 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 world has benefited from it. So yeah. why, it's a why great. Not? It's a, another good story and another like if you're have any interest in in sort of the history of science and stuff. I sure. mean, yeah, it, it heal us cell lines and our uh, friend Henrietta Lacks is a name that will go down as almost like Louis Pasteur to some degree, right? Like sure. that, absolutely, yeah. Yep. She yeah. should. Yeah, absolutely. So let's move on. I, and this is a this is a interesting topic. Alexian Children's book series aims to help parents talk about kid talk to kids about life with a rare disease. Um, and so Alexian, I think they've been purchased by AstraZeneca, but their focus has been on rare disease and obviously rare disease. You're talking limited populations. Um, and but this is this is um, it focused on one family. In particular particular um a woman called rachel pegram who she um she has a uh disease called generalized myasthenia gravis it's a rare autoimmune disease that causes muscle weakness and so when our, our sons were young she couldn't get to soccer games and other things but just because she could i mean she was exhausted and you know because because she was she was dealing with this condition she's then had a a, a, a daughter um much later well, not much later that sounds really patronizing yeah, a couple and of years <laughs> she's older she's she's got a young daughter now her, her her sons are more grown up 
Um, but she thought, in terms of explaining what I'm going through, she actually wrote a, a did like a pitch or wrote a book to to sort of tell her daughter what this condition involved. And you know, then Alex Alexin have been um, got involved um, because the the treatment that that she takes to address. Her, her her condition is is an Alexian drug, and so they 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 put they put pull this book together so that you know there it was for her to explain to her daughter you know what what this condition was and how it affected and obviously applies to other parents with the with the same condition. But on the ba- on the back of that, Alexian are actually looking to produce a series of other books talking about. You know, um, rare diseases and 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 help and explain it to people, which I, I I love initiatives like that. It's um, I think you know it's it's really important to help to f- give people tools to explain what they're going through. I mean, because particularly like say that um, the autoimmune disease, it might not necessarily be obvious to someone looking at her that that she has that condition i mean we we talk you know me i remember there's been all sorts of adverse publicity about me where people look normal but they they're exhausted all the time so people other other people don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with them so to have something like this is i think is is great yeah no i I, it does so many things right it's educational it it, it's um gonna bring together that community which you know the Infor- getting knowledge out there, making people aware of stuff is the first towards step towards curing it, right? Like we're the, – the rare diseases were taboo. I shouldn't say taboo, but they weren't something that were really studied, John, right? Like when you got your PhD sure. or what yep. I did, it was – oh, and by the way, there's these rare diseases. You can learn about them on your own time. Now it's to the forefront. A lot has been learned through rare disease, you know, kind of knocking in genes and knocking out genes. One could argue that – a lot of the vaccines we're using were actually some of it might have been spawned from trying to treat these rare disorders. And and, and then I think it probably not not probably, I'm sure it brings together a lot of people who don't know each other. There's all sorts of groups. I've, I've, I've had been so blessed to have worked in this space. It's it's just amazing how that community works. And Alexion's making a, a big splash with this. I yeah, think sure. it'll have yeah. a huge success and I'm sure others will follow it. But, you know, what What better way than to make a child feel normal, you know, quote, normal, would be to, you know, say, hey, there's a, this book is, is you know, kind of relates to you. That, that's that got to be great, John, right? Like, yeah, considering yeah, you're usually yeah, so, yeah. everything's got to be um, distanced from you. Uh, and I use the word distance, but everything's abnormal or atypical. And to have something that you could potentially, you know, go see on a bookshelf or or get at the library is, is just, it's just got to be a, a great um therapeutic or cathartic moment for for these families and children so great stuff and you know i, I say great stuff too often but this really is a really cool story <laughs> yeah so just just so that they, they've released a second book which is called the day with nurse jen and it follows real life pediatric nurse jennifer lamoth who treats children and teens with atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome yeah. um and they they so and that, that that comes at it from the point of view of kids who can't who are worried about whether they'll be healthy enough to do other it's activities. Just, things I like mean, that. it's so got to be, yeah, for people who are adults that have this, it's got to be such a good feeling to think about how some of the things you might have struggled with or now others are going to be made exposed to and, sure. not, you know, not not necessarily ostracized due to it. So it's just, it's great. It's great. And we got one last one, unless you had uh, more got, about got, the Alexa we, Long. We, Alexa I tell Long. you what, I tell you what, should we skip the, 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 the long one and just go to the, GSK malaria. So sure. we'll edit out this piece. Sure. I think this is a good topic. We'll hold this one till because we're running long. But yeah. th- let's hold this one till next time, and I- I'll make sure. sure it's in there because it is it is good. But yep. this is um we talked to uh, I think last topic we talked about um malaria vaccines in Quillet, and this is actually um that this is really talking about the GSK malaria vaccine. So pilot launch complete. GlaxoSmithKline's malaria shot scores world health organization backing for wider way rollout in Africa. And so this um, va- GSK's vaccine has actually been out there for quite a long time. It, it was actually positively recommended in 2015 by the European regulators. But the world, it, one of the issues with it is efficacy isn't 
isn't great. You know, when we talked about COVID vaccines, there was that 50% bar that um, vaccines were asked to clear um, to before they, you know, be considered to be authorised. And that's part of the reason why the CureVac vaccine eventually did development of that stopped because it didn't hit that 50% bar. Um, the the uh, Mosquirix, I think I think it's Mosquirix, is actually, um, yeah, it is Mosquirix, sorry. It, it's its efficacy isn't great. I think it's in like the 30 to 40% range. Um, so the World Health Organization actually said, rather than just straight out approving it, we want to pilot programs in, in different countries so we can monitor the effect of it in the actual real world so outside the clinical settings. So they did pilots in Ghana, Kenya, Malawi, um, where, where treating 800,000 children. Um, but basically, on the basis of those pilot programs, the World Health Organization has basically said, well, we, we, we really like the data, we like what we've seen, um, and they're now recommending a wider use of the vaccine um, in, in areas with moderate to high levels of malaria transition. Um, it's a base a four-dose course starting at five months of age to help protect against um, malaria or plasmodium falciparium malaria and to, to lower the overall disease burden. And so, so this it, it's 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 very interesting that you know you, on at face value you think well this vaccine might not be that great but by actually doing a, additional studies in the real world the world organization world health organization has turned around and said based on what we observe on these in the field studies this is this is this is going to be a, a, is something we would recommend for yeah. for for much wider use it's an incredible story, right? So there's a vaccine that doesn't have great efficacy, but someone got creative enough to say, hey, why don't we try to vaccinate in conjunction? I think that's the key piece with any sort of, um, the, the, the efficacy of it is dependent upon seasonal drugs, right? Seasonal yep, sure. antimalarial yep, yep. drugs. So, and the numbers are staggering, John. The efficacy yep, of it is absolutely. quite high. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't know if you mentioned the 70%. That, that's no, no, the, I, I didn't. So, yes. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll just say the name of it, Muscurix, is um, very clever, right? Because I don't know how much everybody knows about malaria, but it, it, it does take a, a mosquito. To, you know, it, it egresses within the mosquito, then the mosquito bites you, and that's how you get infected. So, it's mm -hmm. I don't know. That was another clever name. And just the whole design of this, you know, on the surface, John, this – I'm shocked this got approved, right, to, to move mm -hmm. forward. But in part, it's I think it might have to do with the cost a little bit, right? So, tell, you know, I don't want to steal your thunder here, but this is a fantastic um, creative way to, to help the, the – campaign against malaria and and, and we, yeah we, and in terms of the numbers i think it is worth highlighting that so researchers report that after three years combination of vaccine and seasonal anti-malarial drugs lowered the number of clinical episodes of malaria and hospital admissions from malaria and deaths from malaria by about 70 percent compared with just the drugs alone so that tells you the difference that the vaccine is making here um, the data from more than 6,000 children showed the shock could be introduced on top of existing anti-malarial measures to further fight disease, GSK said. So, yeah, it's, I, it, I mean, having yeah. gone through the, the, you know, the, the, the course of pills to, you know, um, you know, yep. to, when traveling to like a develop, developing country, um, to 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 know that this is, is we have another means of addressing it is great, and and yeah. cer certainly to help, you know, certainly to help the kids in developing nations because the basic says the disease kills more than two hundred and sixty thousand children wow. under the age of five in Af in Africa Africa each year. I mean, so if you're saving, you know, a substantial <laughs> percentage of those, that's that's making a huge but difference. But seventy percent of that would be well into the two hundred thousand range. Yeah, absolutely. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, that that that's like helping with the population of Africa with this. And and you know, the the part that we all need to remember is instead of this being killed and them, you know, the vaccine itself being you know stopped, halted, and trying to reinvent it. Now they can go back and try to refine it, right? Like they're not resting on their laurels. This is like probably um, motivating them to, hey, how can we improve it so that it's a hundred percent, right? So yeah, yeah, that, that's yeah. the piece that's just it's and, palpable. And um, hats off to GSK, and let's let's hope we get more meds to the to the uh, resource poor nations of the world or the underdeveloped nations of the yeah. world because that ultimately helps, you know, us in the, you know, in the in the. Uh, of, I don't know what we're called now, 
um, the first world nations or whatever the p- current political term is to call the U.S. and Europe and so forth. But we're we're only going to benefit from a healthier yep. world. And yep. that, that's yep. what we yep. really got to think about. Right. That yep. That's yep. something that we forget here in the U.S. Yep. So, so just just one last thing. Looping back to the Quilly story of earlier, um, one of the things I didn't mention was that the Quilly is there is another mosquito, sorry, malaria vaccine being un- in development using Quilly extract. So you know, we, I, I this story is here because the mosquitics already uses Quilly, but there's there's others on in on in the pipeline like you say it's like this is your first first thing against malaria there's bound that there will always be focus on improved vaccines yeah they've been working on vaccines for a long time in the malaria space this is the first one that's real i think in in, um having a little bit of knowledge here i think there are like five different stages of it within the mosquito it's very hard to target how to clear it you know they tried to wipe out the mosquitoes they tried to get the mosquito to uptake something so that it would kill the malaria. It just, not, none of that sort of work just to, you know, kind of think about the, they tried to target the mosquito at one point, but it, it comes in like five flavors within the mosquito. It's a very evasive. True. Actually, yep. malaria is a fascinating, I won't, I get, I get all science geeked out on you thinking about how cool viruses and things like malaria are, but it's a very, very cool life cycle to it. But let, yeah, we can move on. Na- nature is fascinating in so many ways. It can be really helpful, but it can also be very, very trick or to, tricky. Well, to well you know, and learning about learning about this. learning about the virulency of it, how dangerous it is, is how you you cure it, right? That's the yeah, reverse sure. engineering. Yeah. Of it. Yep. So let's move on, um, and let's uh, go to the main topic, and this one is small molecules, the new agents coming available for COVID patients, and. I have to emphasize up front that nothing has been authorized in terms of, of use for um, the treatment of COVID-19, but there's two two candidates that they will be authorized. There's no doubt in terms of the the numbers that they've, they've uh, produced. Um, but these are both um, drugs that were developed to address COVID-19. So rather than being repurposed molecules like the dexamethasone, um, and we've talked about the antibodies that are used in a hospital setting, um, the the attraction of a, a small molecule drug is that they can be dosed orally. And so, it be, um, you know, administration becomes much easier, uh, particularly if you were talking rollout across the globe. Um, and so I just thought this was a, was a, a timely, yeah. it's timely, Time, I want to add one thing, effects. John. It, it, it's very cost effective too. There are sure, very absolutely. Good biologics. Yeah, yeah, sure. I think it's. An, I, I hate to bring up the cost. Maybe it's because I'm a BD guy, right? But there, there is so much um, uh, uh, hoopla over uh, biologics, and they're great. But that that's mm-hmm. a very. Um, um, I would say, I don't know if expensive is the right word, but it is a costly way to do things. And plus there's some other disadvantages and you touched on it. It's an injectable. It's, sure. you, gotta, you know, it's like oral medications are always the way to go. So with that, I want to set the, 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 the general topic is on small molecules. Cause I think that is how we're going to really um, treat it worldwide. Right. But maybe here mm-hmm. in the U S entitled people, we, we can get biologics, but let's face it, the common American, and the rest of the world, the small molecules is where it's at. That's why we got, we're not going to, I hope we don't talk too much about the people taking crazy parasitic drugs, but no, 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 we'll no, try to stay not. focused. Uh, yeah, yeah, yep. So yeah, I mean, really the, this, I mean, this is the key. Obviously we have vaccines as, as preventatives in terms of, um, in terms of helping people, you know, obviously not catch COVID or if they do catch it, it it's much reduced in terms of impact, but the, also, we need the the key as having these other medicines is to treat people who do become infected if they haven't already been vaccinated. And like we said, there's an equity around the globe, so that you need something, particularly for countries that have low vaccination rates. Um, so the, the 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 other key piece about small molecules is manufacturing can be ramped up really really quickly. Um, once you have that recipe, it it's 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 you know, it's it's a much easier thing to produce in uh, millions of doses, etc. But there's there's two drugs in particular. Um, the first one is a, a drug. Um, now it's it's latterly been developed by Merck, um, but actually it it first came out of um, sorry, I, I it it came out from Emory. Um, it was actually first first identified at Vanderbilt, um, and then it then it 
was um, then I think it was at Emory University yeah. in Georgia did yeah. some work on it. Uh, who then they partnered with Ridgeback Therapeutics. I, I, I want to acknowledge all the all the players in this. Who then, when it came to clinical development, they partnered with Merck. And this was, you know, uh, the the drug is called Molnupiravir. Um, it's it, it's um, this has been there's been quite a bit of attention to this one because um, of the the pedigree of the people involved in the development of it. Um, I, I remember you know when when we first talked about COVID and potential treatments, this was this was actually pointed to as as likely to be you know a, a strong candidate in the long term. There was a lot of hope that this would this would uh, prove to be effective. And in in terms of a phase three study, um, it, they had a 1500 patient phase three trial that ran the randomized newly diagnosed patients to receive drug or placebo and track their outcomes over the next 29 days. Um, the Merck said its independent monitoring board halted the study early after a far smaller sample because they, the efficacy was really good. And so they, um, they, it's, uh, let's see if I can find the numbers. Um, I can't see it. Um, anyway, they, they, it, so it, it, the, the trial was halted early because of, it was showing effectiveness. And we'll see a similar story with the Pfizer drug that we'll talk about later as yeah, well. So, so I'll, maybe I'll just... The, yeah, sure. the, the cool thing here is it, um, you know, remdesivir, the Gilead drug, instead of like blocking replication, this works. And I hack these names up. It's Molnum. Perverier, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but um, the the mal I, I guess, but it, it causes uh, error catastrophe, so forcing the virus to make copying mistakes. Again, clever, John, right? Real yeah, clever absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Chemically yeah. got it to like, and you know, it, and when you think about it, a virus has a lot of things to um, overcome some of the ways of blocking it because the immune system is always trying to block it. The immune system typically does not try to stimulate the virus, which is great when you, it's like, it's like short circuits, short circuit, short circuiting a wire, right? That that's the mechanism here. And it's just, again, I'm always fascinated how, you know, in my mind, it's like, Oh, we should block it. That, that is what the Gilead drug did, obviously remdesivir, but going the other way is typically how you solve the problem, right? In this sure, case, yeah. it's great that it causes it to just make, all sorts of copying areas. And if you don't know how viruses work, if they have any errors, they can't make a lattice. They can't form their nice little um, uh, capsid. And if it can't form a capsid, its material is dead. So so just to kind of let everybody know how it kind of works. But uh, great lineage here. Uh, Vanderbilt, you know, surprisingly, Vanderbilt's at the forefront of a lot of cool stuff. Um, there, there's a company out of there that I, I really shouldn't mention, but th they've got some great, they, they're really rich in the, uh, COVID space. I didn't realize how much they did on the remdesivir. They also have some biologics coming out of there. So I'll plug yeah, so to Vanderbilt. This, and then go ahead. Sorry. It's it's the, it's really cool though. Yeah, this is a really interesting story. It says prior to the pandemic, drug was being developed by nonprofit biotech at Emory, which had received a 15 million grant from NIH to, des to test it against pandemic flu and equine encephalitis. It was then known as EDD 2081. Um, and then w when, when COVID came it was they were they were actually looking to to screen it against pandemic threats in fact a, a guy dr george painter was already looking at that screening targets to as, as to how how they could address pandemics so when corona when the coronavirus that we're dealing with broke out they actually emory pivoted when when the new coronavirus broke out initially trying to bootstrap their efforts with the gofundme as they struggled for funds before licensing the drug to ridgeback biotherapeutics and Ridgeback are a company I'm not familiar with, but it turns out they're based in in Florida, and they they have got you know their their focus is on on looking at viruses, and so they currently got a antibody looking at Ebola virus as as also one of their um one of their uh, pipeline products, and it it's all it has been approved for for treatment of Ebola. So um you know they they, they it's they without knowing much about them, they're probably an interesting company to deal yeah, with. It, well, and I think it's uh, one thing that strikes me is people before the um, pandemic, before COVID really hit, 
they were researching SARS and coronavirus. Sure, and, absolutely. You know, like yeah. thank God they were right. Like we, yep, you know, everybody absolutely. just thinks, oh, we we made a vaccine in in record time. Well, that that started ten years ago, and I guess uh, I'm going to give a shout out to all the basic research going on across the country and random species and random plants and zebra fish. All of it leads to these moments where, you know, suddenly you're uh, a basic research scientist. And next thing you know, you're at the forefront of trying to make small molecules to help with the pandemic. It's, th- it, it's, it's just awesome. It's hugely important. And it is, it's hugely important that all the basic research that's go- going on, but also the recognition that, yes, we ended up with these vaccines very quickly, like you said, but this was on the back of work that had been done for years beforehand because people were already concerned after yes. SARS and MERS the of where the, one, yeah. where, where the next coronavirus was going to hit and yeah. where we're going to be prepared for it. So it was, you're right, it wasn't just a, oh, oh my God, we've got a pandemic to deal with, let's make a vaccine. It was, we've got a pandemic to deal with, but based on what we've done so far, do we have something that might, yeah, John, I, 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 I'm going to be the cynic here, and this might not make it to the actual podcast, but you wonder if some of this research caused it, but that's maybe for another podcast. But I think, no, I think, definitely, I think, I think definitely you're, way, good, out, you're yeah. way out on a limb there, and we should saw that particular <laughs> limb off. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It, 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 it's something where, you know, I, I, I'm going to push right up to the edge, John, as you know. But no, sure, it, yeah, it's, yeah. it is... Um, you know, as I sit back and think of, you know, I've been very fortunate to sit, sit, go to a couple different academic, academic institutions and see all the research that's been, been done in some of them. And I remember friends that were doing things that I considered somewhat boring, but still still wanted to learn it because I was just just had a thirst for like, why are, wow, wow, you're doing this real basic stuff. And, and I was always trying to be immuno-oncology vaccine at the forefront, but that you know, that really built the foundation of who I am, learning that like simple, and I, I won't bore you with immunological techniques and some of the cell lines and species that people were working in. But all of that was like, it built that foundation and respect for it. I think that's the word that comes out. I really respect basic research. And sure. um, it's something yeah. that I hope we continued. You know, when you think about dollars and funding, hey, that all of that goes towards these basic labs. And it's it, it it manifests itself ten years later in something that's rolling up to help save the world, right? So it's yeah, just, it's great. and that, and that's why we're always looking not just at what's happening in COVID and stuff, but also what uh, that when you see these articles about basic research, what might actually be it, the foundation of something that could be transformative in 10, 15, 20, 25 years time. It's, you're yeah. always looking out for that. John, um, we are so, going long today and we still yeah, got a lot so, to do, but tell us about the competition, right? Do we want to switch gears? Well, yeah, I am getting there. Just, yeah, the reason we're going long is we haven't done this for a while. Um, so just, just I had said that none of these were authorized, but I'm, I I I misspoke. Um, actually, the UK has authorized Molnupiravir Prevere um, for the treatment of mild to moderate COVID nineteen in adults with a positive SARS CoV two diagnostic test, and who have at least one risk factor for developing severe illness. So this this is out there in the UK. At least I'm sure other other countries will follow. Well, you know, it makes a um, lot more sense than you know, parasite drugs. So let's hope it gets more uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, yeah, it's absolutely. I'm not, not going to touch that one. Um, I, and and so the the, the competition uh, because we also want to acknowledge and I to me this this drug has come flown much more under the radar probably because Pfizer have had so much publicity because of their involvement with the with the vaccine, but they actually um, they they early November they. Pfizer um, showed statistically significant efficacy data for its potential COVID-19 pill among people who haven't been hospitalized with the virus. Um, A scheduled interim analysis showed an 89% reduction in risk of COVID-related hospitalization or death from any cause compared to placebo in patients treated within three days of symptom onset. Now, this is is one thing that is important for for these oral drugs. Based on, on so the the research so far, um, the the I think efficacy is based on catching 
uh, things early. So if you if you feel you if this if you are showing symptoms, you really want to be diagnosed quickly to if uh, once these are authorized um, to get on a course because that's where that's where they really are applicable. Is in that I think Pfizer's three days, the the Merck is is five days. Um, but anyway, it, it, it's so it's, it's good numbers, John. This is yeah, amazing. It's still, it's still, it's still right? good numbers, like, exactly. Yeah. So, it, yeah. So the 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 Pfizer drug is called the Paxlovid, um, and again, the, the its mechanism of action is completely different from the Merck drug. So, I mean, you could almost envisage a case where you may at some point have a cocktail of the two and be administered yeah. if, if you're looking to to address things in people. Um, it's a protease inhibitor. So yeah. it, it basically, it's meant to prevent the coronavirus from replicating. It's the, the, it is actually co-administered with ritonavir, um, which is, is a, a long, it's a long approved drug because ritonavir actually helps Paxlovid stay active in the body longer. And I, I don't know much about the background, but again, that, that, this, that, I need to do some more digging that because that is really interesting. Yeah. Um, and actually, you the use mechanism the drug. is fascinating, right? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah go, go ahead. That's no, fine. I, it, well, the, the, I, I don't know much about the um, uh, co-med there, but um, the, the combination of them is fascinating in that it, it it's clever how they've gotten to a point where they've, you know, protease inhibitors are, are, are standard antivirals. It's what we use in HIV and stuff like that. So they've taken probably some form of that. Retinovir, I do not know what that is exactly. But again, we think about how um, how they got to this point and, and how they uh, how how there's a sea of medications to take and, and trying to tease it to just two. I mean, it'd be great if they could just do someone with like 10 different small molecules in some sort of small little cocktail. And, you know, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. And by the way, now I'm, I'm babbling a little. That's how cancer so, therapeutics so, 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 uh, You know, the original cancer therapeutics, they dosed people with five, six different types of uh, um, vincyclamir and all those sorts of things until they kind of teased it out. But uh, one last, John, I just, wanted to talk I, I a little bit mentioned- more. Go ahead. A bit, a, a bit of background on Ritonavir. It's actually it's sold under the brand name Nor Norvir, and it's an antiretroviral medication used along with other medications to treat HIV AIDS. Yeah. I, I I know. I mean, I've I've worked on Ritonavir in the past. I think in interaction studies. So not not the actual. I was it wasn't supporting the actual development program, but C- certainly we, I we've we've I've worked on it um, just in terms of you know bio bioanalytical. Two um, things I want to so, unpack that you mentioned. One is the efficacy early. And so anybody out there who's just in denial that you're not feeling well, geez, go get looked at, right? Like that's the yep. first thing. Because the early, the, this these medications typically work, as you said, within a five-day window. So if you're exhibiting signs, go, go to the hospital or go get tested, f- find out. Don't just, you know, I hear a lot of people like, oh, I think it's just a seasonal flu. You know, John, I took, as a side note, I took my first COVID test because um, uh, somebody I know had been COVID positive and I was on my way to uh, Vegas and we can talk a little bit about my trip, but I, I, it's a, just because I'm trying to be a good citizen, a good Samaritan. I, I went ahead and gave myself a COVID test. I turned out negative, but that those things, if, you know, it's just like any sort of cancer or any sort of sickness, the earlier you can detect it, the, the better off you're going to be in terms of treatment and, and potential out, uh, uh, subsequent outcome, because it upstream early and often gives more pathways to choose from. So I think that's an important part to hammer home. These things are only effective if you catch it. If you're on your deathbed, that's when you got to get to the biologics. Sure, absolutely. Exhibiting fever and not feeling well, get out there. And if you're really getting to a state where you're positive and your viral load's high, they can pump you full of these things and cure you. So there's my little diatribe, John. Sorry. I think you know, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I, I, that was why I mentioned it because I think it is key that if you feel unwell, go to the doctor and get yourself checked out. Don't yeah, just I mean, think I can go over this. You know, you John, know, it, everybody says, oh, I don't have time and this and that. But man, getting sick on COVID, people who are, I know a few people that ended up, they've been positive and then you got to quarantine and you know, your life gets upside down for five, 10 days versus just get it, you know, go, go often and, and don't like hide from it is what I'm trying to say. I find myself sure. sometimes thinking, oh, well, maybe I'm not sick, but if I'm feeling sick, John, I'm going to go get tested. 
Yep. So I, I mean, th- not not much more to say on this other than like um, one thing, that, like we meant, we touched on the ease of manufacture, etc. Both Merck and Pfizer are, are already um, in, you know, d- developing agreements with um, manufacturers in, with production sites in middle and low income countries to actually expand man- manufacturing across the globe. So if these are authorized, uh, the, it, these could these could become available pretty quickly just because of the the manufacturing manufacturing network they're set yeah, to not. They're not they, these are they're, they're well established drugs they're being repurposed i think a lot of it no these the, oh these are these are new these two but Paxil, these are new. yeah uh, okay okay so yeah. when you say new that's within the last year and a half to two years right i, I mean the, these are these are drugs that you know they've never been they've okay. never They've been in development. They've never been approved for anything. The only well, one that's that what I'm, been, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, the, yeah, only, yeah. The, the only one that has been approved is Ritonavir, but that Ritonavir isn't the active agent in the Pfizer drug. It's there to help the oh. the Paxlovid, and that's why I, I think I'd love to see what the mechanism, what 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 it is about the Ritonavir that helps that. that yeah, here, uh, here comes my small longer. molecule ignorance, right? In my mind, right. it's all just one chemical entity, and you're just bending a carbon somewhere. But you're saying <laughs> this is somewhat of a you know a novel sort of approach right is that I, is, I, yeah. I think I think it, these are these are novel new drugs yeah yeah, yeah that's, it, a, that's great I, I, in my mind it was all repurposed so thanks for clarifying that yeah I, I mean it's, it's so because because of its mode of action there are you know there's some concern about molnute previous mutagenicity and um, because it, it, it but you know I think this is stuff that will will um will emerge in the longer term but ultimately you know these the, these are these are the these two drugs could could be a, a huge part of actually ending yeah. COVID nineteen as we're dealing with it now and and getting us back to a more normal way of life. So in terms of as, as a step forward, in terms of where we where we've been, the these two these two drugs are huge. I mean, it it's it it again it it's it's. It, it's fascinating. I, I love being part of, you know, supporting the pharmaceutical industry because all this stuff is so interesting and exciting. Yeah. And, and it le- it sometimes can leave you speechless, right? That, because yeah, sure. this Absolutely. is like when you're, when you're trying, what I think what you're trying to say is vaccines are great, but we're just continuing in a cycle until you do something to prevent replication of the virus and that's what these things are doing right so that's that's really where you know if you can if you're infected and you can take something that not only helps you get better but also prevents aggression egressing of the virus right it's proliferation yep. and then subsequent yep absolutely yep, sure. to somebody else that that's the that is the part that um you know, we, it could be aspirin at some point, you know, and we, let's talk about these downsides a little bit, but you know, every, every drug, even aspirin has a downside effect. If mm-hmm. you take too much sure. of it, right. Yep, yep, it can hurt yep. your, you know, your liver and stuff. And we don't, because we've made so many good things like Aleve and all these new versions of ibuprofens that we don't talk about it as much, but these drugs do have some downside to them. But I feel like most of the time that's overblown. I feel like when you see a commercial for an approved drug and there's like, they list all these symptoms. It's like, good Lord, who would ever take this? Right. Yeah, but like, exactly. Yeah. Know, it's also like what, again, it gets back to what is, what do you, what do you like with the environment? If you have a lot of allergies and you know, you're, you're sick all the time, that becomes a different path for what you want to take. But if you're healthy and relatively healthy, John, I'm going to put you in a relatively healthy category, but you, you should be fine when you're taking these things. And I hope I didn't sure. poke fun at you. Yeah. There, but, you know, I'm, I'm relatively healthy too, John. Right. Um, yeah. But it's but, interesting. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the downside. The downsides, I, I think that, honestly, I think the article on that it was a little bit overblown. But it, it, it's, it is useful because we should acknowledge Mark Dennison um, because he it was his lab at Vanderbilt that Monute Prefer originally came from, as did Remdesivir. Um, so he has been looking at coronaviruses um, since the mid-80s. Um, so he's he's been looking at these viruses and, and how to treat them. Um, and so it, it, it was really getting his take on on you know was was there likely to be any issues with with these drugs? I mean, they, like say because of the mechanism of action of monute preview, there's there's a potential mutagenicity piece. Um, so that that may mean that certain populations don't take it. I mean, he he certainly in the article he's the one that's saying that if because 
um, Paxlovid and Molnupravir operate both differently to actually combine the two may be the most powerful combination. Absolutely. That, that you can treat that. And, and, and Paxlovid does not have any... Um, because of the way it operates, doesn't have any mutagenicity concerns. I mean, like I say, all drugs have side effects. Um, it's just, it's, it's. I think it's, it's, it's interesting to discuss up front, you know, what your concerns might be. But ultimately, with drugs like these, the benefits far outweigh any downside to them. Um, so, yeah. it, it, I mean, <laughs> well, well it, it, it's wine. interesting. Yeah, there's, and you're right. I, I think oftentimes they, you know, when you see things like mutagenicity and it's like you know it's got carcinogens like cigarette smoke it's just it's all got to be taken with a grain of salt if you if you pump an animal full of enough saline you could give it cancer is the way i kind of think of it so it just just depends on how they study it certainly but we we want to know obviously you want to take things that are going to be safe for you although um you know what's the the alternative is is obviously bad if you pr progress uh too far with any sort of um infectious agent such as coronavirus. What I think is fascinating is I wonder back in 1986 when Mark Dennison is studying coronavirus and everybody around him is like, why are you looking at that? You know, HIV is yeah, where it's at. Yeah. And here he is, you know, 30 years later, a hero to some degree, right? He should be applauded for sure. his life yep. uh, dedication to this. And if we hadn't had scientists such as him, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about small molecules that are uh, life-saving. So, you know, I, I hope everybody appreciates the um, – the work that goes into some of these things, how basic research laboratories are really supporting our future as we speak right now. And then also um, the, 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 the side effects are such a hot topic. And I, you know, I talk about my brother a little bit and he's scared of just about everything. He's, but, but I, I think, I think that's a bad way to, to look at it. And, and really I, I wouldn't, you know, and always talk to your physician, obviously, but he, the, these things are, are, for the most part, they wouldn't be on the market if they were holistically exactly. killing yeah. people, right? Exactly. Um, or, or even really making people sick or causing any sort of, um, you know, cancerous type side effects. That's, those are things that they just, they just don't get this far after um, f any sort of safety study. So anyhow, that's my, again, little, little bit of flavor for you, John. I don't know where so yeah, I against think, time here. I think this I think, is I think, fantastic. I think, I, think, I think we can wrap up and say well, just, I, just to emphasize yeah. both both these drugs aren't authorized yet, but based on the data, obviously they've been submitted to the the relevant authorities, and I'm sure we'll yeah. we'll, we'll see see that come through, and obviously we'll discuss that and when for it, any when of you that happens. are out there listening and want therapeutics and they're taking parasitic drugs, please stop. Go find these drugs. They're Paxlovid, right? Uh, Molnupravir, right? Um, so go go find these drugs and stop taking things that uh, are, you know, really um, have very little chance of being effective, well, even though you might feel better taking it. It's not due to that, I promise. Yeah, they, they, they can't take them yet, but ultimately it's like if you can get vaccinated, get vaccinated. If you well, get you can't, sick, so you can't take them yet, but okay. No, you, it, really, it will happen. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, 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 they're authorized in the UK, but they're not here yet. I mean, like I said. Are but, there the, clinical the, trials the, ongoing? I guess I didn't look at that. I think that the, the phase three data were so good that I think the trials were halted early. Okay. Because okay. the because of the efficacy they showed, so See, like my, said, my the, knowledge is power, John. If you ask the, your physicians the right questions, usually you can get any yeah, drug you want. Yeah, but I suppose yeah. not. The, 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 these aren't authorized yet, but okay. I, I think based on the data, these will be coming soon. I I cannot imagine that they 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 won't be available. You know, in, in the not too distant future. Do you want? But, um, we do have one last topic on the on our agenda. I don't know if we want to take a second. I, I love the idea of talking about long term. Is resistance a concern? Do we want to take a minute there? Yeah, you can you can touch on it. I, I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I I think that's a good one, John. And and um, the only like my take home message is uh, bring it on, and we'll provide medicines that will evolve as fast. That that's sort of like it's a nice thing to have if we see that drugs are effective enough over time that the, the virus becomes resistant because historically we've been able to uh, overcome that. I mean, antibiotics certainly is an, an indication that, I don't know if you remember, John, 10 years ago, we were all going to die because our antibiotics sure. yep. are no longer working. Well, you know, people put their hard hat on in basic research and have definitely made advancements to ensure. And, and then we stopped, you know, they started giving it before they used to just dispense antibiotics. You could come in with a runny nose, here's an antibiotic. They started kind of slowing that down a little bit. But I think this is a case where 
yeah, of course there's going to be resistance. The, it, we're, it's naive of us to think we're so great that we're going to be able to just simply eradicate the coronavirus, which, sure. by the way, yep. it's not new, right? I mean, yep, this sure. has been around for hundreds of years. It's just it's evolved in such a way. It kind of got ahead of us. Now we're dealing with it. We'll get ahead of it. And it'll just be yep, a sure. – it, it's yep. probably – I don't think it's – I feel like – the initiative is so strong, it's not going to be like the flu. I do think that in a decade, we may not need a COVID vaccine. Sure. But, you know, yeah. time will determine. I, I do think yeah. you'll see some resistance, but I, I think we'll get ahead of it. And I'm optimistic about our vaccines in terms of mRNAs and things like that to help outpace it. It doesn't have the genetic shift of influenza. And mm -hmm. that's a good thing, right? So yeah. Yeah. If, if you know a little bit about influenza, it has a lot of um, pieces to it that can uh, mutate a little bit quicker. Let's hope coronavirus, you know, doesn't fall into that category. And historically, it hasn't. It has been a little more fragile, is how I think of it. So anyhow, yeah. that's my two cents on it. It's going to happen, but I think we'll overcome it. I think it, yeah, it doesn't mutate as quickly. And then the more we get vaccinated, then the less chance it has to mutate as well. So we we we've got that working in our favour. Um, I think you know you talk about resistance. Yes, resistance is likely to occur with drugs, but also I think um, I mean there has been that issue recently where companies working on antibiotics haven't they've they've got them approved but have made no money on them and it's not been a a profitable field for 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 companies to focus on i think you know covid has definitely ch alerted um pharmaceutical companies that you know we still need to be looking for antibiotics etc cetera, etc cetera, to deal with these kind of of things when they flare up so that there is going to be increased focus back in this area i'm sure so yeah, yeah if, 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 if resistance occurs then i'm sure there'll be other candidates that'll be coming through to to help address that well, well, John, you you really did a good job of uh, bringing me out of my funk. I don't know what was wrong with me this morning. I was in a crabby mood. Maybe you didn't pick up on it, but this has been a great podcast. It's really got me, you know, I, I love doing this podcast with you because it, it, it really does uh, make me feel young again in terms of my uh, spirit when it comes to medicine. So th that's very uplifting. Um, so anyhow, that that's where I'm out. It's just, uh, you know, any last thoughts on this? It's been a fascinating um, topic to discuss. Uh, I hope our audience feels, you know, a little bit better about the future of treating COVID. There's hopefully someday you'll, you know, it'll be an aspirin bottle in your uh, cabinet and, you know, when you're not Don't feeling good. Or, yeah, sure. yeah, you know what I mean? The, the, you, I envision a day where it's just, it could be as simple as you don't need it at all or, you know, hey, we're, we're going to pop a, a, a some sort of um, antiviral just, you know, hey, it looks like you're COVID positive. Here's this prescription or sure. better yet, you know, we, the testing's so easy now. It's like, oh, look, I'm, I, I, I swab my nose. Oh, crap. I'm positive here. I'll start taking some because that's, that's pretty u ubiquitous these days, but it's, it's just great <laughs> stuff. And I uh, really enjoyed it. I, I, one, you know, we, um, one thing I, I kind of want to just round out, I want to take a small step back and we talked about the Pfizer vaccine for approval for children. I don't know if you saw this story, John, but you talked about the caps. And when you said there's an orange and a green, you know, they still messed that up. Somebody oh, was injecting the children with the full doses. Oh, really? So, yeah, somebody. And it happened twice in the same hospital. I feel like it was in Florida. Can't quite remember where it was. But that's something we'll keep an eye out on is, um, you know, e even the, the people are so, so some people, a, a segment of the population so afraid of the virus Children are getting one third the dosage, which is fantastic, right? It makes sense. But even those children that got the full dose, nothing wrong with them, John. I think sure. it was up to like That's 27 true. children yeah. got it or something. It was a big number. But man, that would be scary as heck. Yeah. But, the, you know, that that just goes to show how safe it really is. And, you know, uh, well, people would say, what's the long term this and that? But it, it's been uh, out there long enough now that we would yeah. we would be seeing something if we had a problem yeah. with it. And this, what, what's the long term? This or that applies to every meal. Yeah, yeah. Planet. Hey, me, me eating potato chips is killing me slowly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. It's funny you talk about the mix. Well, it's not funny, but the mix up of color caps because that you know that is is the different colored caps is essential well, to doing bio bioanalysis. You know yeah. where biomarkers are one colored cap and different anticoagulants of different caps and, and everything else. So yeah, it's um, it's well, everything it, is a fundamental to the way we operate. Yeah, it's it's almost like they're you know they wouldn't be suitable to work in our GLP laboratory, right? It, it does take not, some not, degree of um, 
you know, smarts, uh, and I'm not talking about book smarts. It's just really, you got to stay focused in that. That's sure. a lot. That's Absolutely. a lack of focus by those individuals. Yep. And to have it happen yep. twice is just, you know, maybe it's a, a training issue, but whatnot, but that's to keep an eye on and just thought I'd bring it up. And with that, maybe we'll move on to some up. feedback or yeah, any feedback. Uh, I, I have a little feedback. So, um, you know, the podcast 50 was quite the hit, uh, John, when we did it, our video, I've had three people reach out to me and say they watched the video and said how handsome I looked, how skinny I looked. Uh, thanks for that, everybody. No, that, no, no one said that, by the way. Um, but uh, <laughs> most notable was um, a friend I went to um, at the University of Pittsburgh and then my brother. Uh, both those individuals were um, pretty impressed with the, the podcast. Uh, my brother was like, hey, I really liked it, but a lot of it went over my head. But just want to give a shout out to um, both of those individuals, my brother Rich and my buddy Hans, who happened to listen to it. So all good stuff, John. I don't know if anybody you know happened to pick up on it. Certainly got a lot of um, hits on LinkedIn, and you know it, it was good it, it, to do that one and enjoyed. I, I'll video. be I'll be honest with traveling and stuff. I hadn't even realized it was out there, so I'll have to go looking for it myself. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Is it, it's so. always surprising because I haven't seen it yet. I, I saw you know I saw it on LinkedIn, and then I promoted it and stuff like that. Kind of caught a little bit of it, and the pictures we took were. Well, good. Uh, thank you for that, Jeremy. You took the right side of me, which is my good side. That's my that's my steel magnum look. Um, <laughs> um, but no, John, that, that's a little feedback. I don't know if Jeremy had any more, but you know, with that, maybe we'll. I know we got podcast fifty two coming up. We're going to leave that as a teaser in terms of what we're going to talk about. But we welcome anybody to send some topics if you're interested. And then, uh, I don't know, John. I, I, I'm excited to tell you about. Vegas and my weekend and what's go going up. Go, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'd never been to Las Vegas, John, and we, we ended up going from Thursday to Sunday and we saw three shows. We shopped, we, um, you know, did some gaming and happened to win a little bit at the sports book. We had a lot of fun. Um, it, you know, I had the, the, I paced myself the right way. It was, a felt good Thursday night, recovered, felt good Friday night, recovered. And then Saturday, um, you know, two thirty in the morning, still in the casino. My wife and I, we we were there with some other couples. We didn't spend too much time with them, but we were all just having a good time. And um, you know, I, I, it's hard to explain how much I did without boring everybody. But it was a whirlwind. We had to buy a bag to bring our stuff home. We definitely went out the intention to shop. We found the the outlet malls. They have about five seven miles away from the strip. There was a bunch of outlet malls, so we shopped out there, and then couple stores that aren't out there. We shopped at in Caesars. We stayed at Caesars Palace, which is a wonderful place. We were the guest of honor at a show called uh, Fantasy. It's a, the number one running um, adult Vegas show uh, for uh, in 2020. And uh, yeah, last number one show in 2020 and 2021. And then it's a 22 year running show. And our, one of our friend, uh, our colleague, Adrian Chicos, she knows the uh, Lenore, who is the head of the show. And so we had a great time. We got honored for, you know, they kind of said happy anniversary to my guests and got to meet them afterwards. So it was a whirlwind, John, and just an incredible time. And, you know, now I'm I'm thinking about my 50th and plan on going back to see the Patriots play. <laughs> Patriots play the uh, Raiders. Ha haven't had a date yet, but there will be a game. And that'll be my 50th. And you're welcome to come out to Vegas for my 50th, John. But, but that, I'll get some dates if you're interested. But I'm inviting oh, everybody. Sure. No, I, no yeah. wife on that one. So we'll see what I'm, happens in I'm Vegas. I'm overdue returning <laughs> to Vegas. Yes. Yeah, but uh, for, for somebody who had never been, we uh, people who uh, – we have a couple, not only Adrian, but Chris Coffin and even Ami. They're all entertainers. They've Chris worked in Vegas as a dancer for 10 or 12 years. And when I told him what we did in three days, he was like, man, you guys are like experts. And – we didn't even map it out. We just got there and, you know, we've traveled enough, John, that you, you figure it out, right? But we had just such oh, a true. great time. The weather was perfect. I don't think we saw a cloud. It was like 75, 80 degrees the whole time. The only thing is um, the Rolling Stones were playing at the football stadium. Sting was playing at our uh, hotel. He had opened up on Saturday. And then uh, there was a Canela um, plant was his last name, a big uh, fight. And so uh, talking to somebody in a shop who was, you know, working there, they're like, we've been averaging about $2 million a weekend. They had an $11 million weekend. And basically it was 
almost back to normal in terms of how oh, the city yeah. felt because it swells. You know, sure. twenty thousand people come to see the fight. You know, twenty thousand to see um, the Rolling Stones. Unfortunately, we had tickets to a comedy club with some of the couples we went to. So I had to go to that. I had to go to that. But this is why my wife is such a great person. I was just like, hey, let's just pay the 90 bucks for these tickets and, well, you know, whatever, 90 times two or whatever. But then let's just go to the Rolling Stones. And my wife looked at Jimmy and said, no, that's not what friends do. And that's why I love my wife so much, John. So I did miss the Rolling Stones and all that sort of good stuff. But like I said, we saw um, that show Fantasy. We saw it was a really good comedy show. We laughed a lot and hung out with those those couples we were with. And then we saw um, something called Love. It was a Circus Ole show to the Beatles, which was fantastic. So three shows in three nights. I did lots of sports betting. I got up at 5.30 in the morning on Saturday to start watching Premier League soccer because that's when it started. And I had a bunch of bets. It was Man City, Man United. And I'm just babbling, John. Um, this weekend, I don't have much planned. I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to use my uni grill, uh, my uni pizza oven. I've been catching some heat from people at work. So I think I'm going to try to make some leftover Make some pizza and bring a little in. That's for you, Don Dufield, and you'll be on the show here soon. All right, John. So yes. go ahead and tell me what's going on in your world. I, I just vomited information. So, so my world is really exciting at the moment. So this afternoon, I go for a COVID test um, just to prepare for flying to through the UK to to Barcelona. Um, so, based, so I COVID test this afternoon. Hopefully, that should be negative to allow me to go to to Spain in the hope that obviously I, I still need my QR code from the Spanish government. Um, so yeah, I fly out on Sunday. Um, so get into Barcelona Monday afternoon. Um, red meeting starts late Tuesday. Um, one disappointing thing I found about EBF is. Um, which is European Bioanalysis Forum. Um, they they just announced that their evening cocktail sessions aren't going to happen, and that was a very integral part of the meeting yeah. where you have an intense meeting all the way. Th- it, it is a great meeting in terms of learning stuff, but it was always nice to have that wind down time where everyone mixed together yeah. and um, chatted, etc. But they can't really uh, reconcile. Um, the cocktail session with the COVID controls they're putting in place. So we'll see how see how that goes. I I just suspect that everyone will go at the bar and then drink giant goldfish bowl sized gin and tonics. So, yeah, yeah. No, those are you know somewhere in there you got to find a way to co co mingle. I'm sure people will still want to oh, do will. something, but yeah. but you're right. Those cocktail hours are just. Because then, you know, if there's a speaker you saw that you liked or even some friends, yeah. you always, you, you yep. know, it, it's electric, uh, you know, in our world. It's it's like the red carpet, John. Right? <laughs> so, so, so so that hasn't happened. But but then, you know, I mean, British people abroad at a conference, of course, there's going to be alcohol flowing. So, so we'll <laughs> well, see I'm just goes. jealous you're going to Barcelona in Spain. I'm sure it's beautiful this time yeah, of year. So, 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 so last, last night was research trying to figure out eating plans for when I'm there by myself and to have a couple of restaurants lined up yeah, and yeah, yeah I, I'm, I haven't booked anything yet, but I'm, I'm sort of slowly figuring out the trip. You like paella, yeah, I take it? Are you a paella fan? Actually, or? I'm, I, I'm not really that excited about paella. I mean, some of the tapas is fantastic, but then there's also, you know, some, some Michelin star places that I've been to in the past that I might just indulge myself for the first like really fancy restaurant in a couple of years. So yeah. I'll probably do that and, do you and then, for... then the other the other big piece is i'm flying in and out through london so then i'm also trying to hope trying to figure out which terminals i'm flying out of to, to know if i can get to i have time to get to duty free so i can bring back some nice chase gin so yeah oh yeah it. hey that that, that duty free <laughs> take advantage of and the, I am so, good. so um and i i think some others from kcs are joining you right i think jeff goddard might be going with you and then um is that right did you is he going with you or no uh, uh, there's Jeff Goddard's going going as well. Okay. Um, I think Jeff's got a couple of other appointments. Then we we will get together at, at the meeting. Yeah, so, he's yeah. our he's our you know one of our newest members of the KCS team. He's our chief commercial officer. Great guy, great asset to um, KCS, and he's been wonderful to work with. And you'll have a good trip with him. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, um, I'm looking forward to it. And then of course, uh, when you go to you mentioned a, a, a restaurant there, and I'm not that familiar. Is it a chain in in uh, or not a chain, but a high end is that like their capital grill or something in barcelona so oh, high end. so the 
So the two places that I'm looking at, I've been to one's called Alchem. It, it's a lot of it is um, in in Barcelona. There's a lot of chefs who, who they got their single single yeah. restaurant, but there's some very innovative uh, cooking. And one's called Alchemia, which I've been to in the past, and the other one is another place called Saint Santi, which is I think it's five senses. Um, so they're Ooh. my big, they're my big indulgent restaurants. And what I'll, do you look for? Tapas or you said tapas, it's, which I get, but are you a? The, 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 there's other tapas places I'll go to. These these places tend to be like um, tasting menus. So it's yeah. just it's a, you say I'm I'm going to take one of two menus and then the the dishes will come out. Ah, nice. And it's, it's just it's just it's just very skilled cooking oh, yeah. and, and yeah, I know, uh, so. uh, uh, and it's always. Um, Typically, um, seafood. Some t- usually some yeah, seafood, exactly. some qu- yeah. some birds and quails and yep. and game, and yep. then and then some um, hassenpfeffer, right? I mean, I remember. Or is that not you, you stay away from those types of things? Yeah, well, I mean, certainly the, the uh, alchemy actually has a, a game tasting menu, which I'm, if I go there, I'm not likely to do. I'm likely to go with the more fish based. But that was I've never seen that approach. That's that's interesting. Yeah, but yeah, uh, it, it, sh- it should be it should be good. Yeah. Um, yeah, looking forward to it. So I think we probably should la- wrap yep. up because we've been going long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're going long. But I've heard people still don't mind. They put us on in the background, John. Okay, so <laughs> but it's been great. Uh, Nice pod, not nice, great podcast number 51 and safe travels to you, John. And we'll Thanks catch up in another week or so. Yeah, and have a great Thanksgiving. And then, oh, yeah. we, fig- then we figure out number 52. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I could talk more about Thanksgiving, but I got a big old bird in the freezer and we'll cook that thing up. Yeah, we'll, 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 but no, I don't think we have to mention 52. We'll just tease the audience, right, John? Sure. So safe yep. travels I'm- to you and happy Thanksgiving. Yep, same to you.